saying to you, I'm old school, so I have my notes. Um, I did do a little chart um, for your benefit. It's basically the people that we talked about. There's Michael Black and his wife Maggie were married. Mike Robinson and Kelly Robinson were married. Dennis Munoz and Courtney Schiretto were married. Edwin Velasquez and Dina Velasquez were married. Heather Wycliffe, Keith Wycliffe were married. We heard about Katrina and possibly others. And we heard about drugs. Drugs related to Heather and Keith Wycliffe. Drugs related to Dennis Munoz and Courtney Schiretto. Drugs related to Michael Black. Drugs related to Michael Robinson and Kelly Robinson. We don't know any information regarding any drugs in Megan Black, and I'm not going to talk about that. We don't know any information regarding drugs in Edwin Velasquez and Dina Velasquez, and I'm not going to talk about that. Well, you first heard the state's opening. He talked to you about how this isn't a soap opera. But as we got involved in this case, we know that it sort of is some sort of a soap opera. There's a lot of things that are going on in Mays Landing at this time in 2015 with almost all of these people all related to drugs, all related to marriages, all related to who's having affairs with who. Now you'll note that I have some arrows coming from this center. It's only in relation to Michael Black. Michael Black who has a relationship with Kelly Robinson. Michael Black who has a relationship with Courtney Schiaretta. Michael Black who has a relationship with Katrina. Michael Black who has a relationship with Heather and Keith Whitley. These are the main characters that I want you to think about. These are the main characters that you heard testimony. <coughs> First and foremost, I want to thank you on behalf of my client, Dennis, for being here for the past seven days, listening to testimony, being attentive to every witness that was in the witness stand, listening to the judge's instructions, this is very important to Dennis, to Edwin, and to you as jurors and your civic duty. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me start off by telling you that November 9, 2015 was a tragic day for the family of Michael Black. On that day, Megan Black lost her husband. Her children lost their father. His parents lost a son. His sister lost a brother. His uncle lost a nephew. And many people lost a friend. And though this was a tragedy, and though it may emote sympathy in you, I want you to have a clear mind and an open view when you look at the evidence that was presented, because you have to be objective. The judge is going to give you instructions later regarding the case, and he's going to instruct you on the law. And if you remember in my opening statement, which was very brief, because I'd like to keep things brief as much as possible, I told you that you are the triers of fact. You are the person to determine what evidence was credible and what evidence wasn't. I asked you to take a look at the witnesses as they testified. I asked you to take a look to see what their demeanor was, if they had any motive regarding their testimony. <coughs> and I ask that to you because Dennis Munoz's fate lies solely in your hands. Not in the judge's hands, not in my hands, in your hands. And I want you to know that the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, each and every element of each and every count that Dennis is charged with. And you have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt, not only that he committed this murder and the weapons offenses associated with this murder, but also that in 2018, he also committed witness tampering. First, let me start telling you about Dennis. Dennis has no burden. I have to 
present a defense for him. He doesn't have to take the stand. He doesn't have to tell you anything. Dennis, as he sits here in this courtroom, and as he sat here in this courtroom for the past seven days, eight days including today, is cloaked with the veil of innocence. And that's never removed from him at this point. You've heard me say that the state has to prove Dennis guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt, ladies and gentlemen, is the highest standard of proof in court. In civil litigation, which some of you may be familiar with, the proof is proof by a preponderance or proof by clear and convincing evidence. These are lower burdens. A preponderance of the evidence simply means that one side has more evidence in its favor than the other, even by the smallest degree. Clear and convincing evidence is evidence that establishes a high probability that, a fact, that the fact sought to be proved is actually true. The main reason that the proof, the high proof standard of reasonable doubt is used in criminal trials is that criminal trials can result in the deprivation of a defendant's <coughs> liberty, an outcome far more severe than what happens in civil court, where money is exchanged as a common remedy. That high standard of proof is grounded on a fundamental value determination of our society that is far worse to convict an innocent man than to set a guilty man free. Ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> this trial is not a situation where you're being asked to decide who told the better story. You're not standing between the prosecutor and the defendant and being asked to choose which side is better. By default, you're required to return to give a verdict of not guilty and you can only leave the defendant's side if the prosecutor presented to you such quality and quality of quantity and quality of evidence that the only reasonable interpretation of the facts is that Dennis is guilty. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, the criminal justice system has led Dennis down a long road. He's now arrived here at trial where a brick wall stands, that brick wall is reasonable doubt. Unless the state knocks down every brick, doubt still exists, and Dennis gets to go home. Remember, reasonable doubt comes from evidence and lack of evidence. Now, you've sat here for the past seven days, and you've heard several witnesses testify regarding this case. You've heard testimony from law enforcement, neighbors of Michael Black, expert witnesses, so-called friends of Michael Black, and one of Michael Black's lovers. I'm gonna go over some of the testimony with you, but again, it's your recollection of the matters that um, count, not my recollection, but you've heard a lot of testimony over the past seven days. And I just want to touch on some of that testimony. Officer Murray, if you remember, testifies He's the first officer to arrive. A call comes in to 911 at 739. He tells you that he's familiar with the Cloverleaf neighborhood, yet for some reason he and the other officers get lost on their way there. He's the first to arrive on scene at 743. He sets up a perimeter, and his perimeter is located on the side of 5906 Elmhurst, the side that faces Barry. And if you remember, when I asked him on cross-examination, what was it like? Was it dark? And he said, yes, it was very dark. Were there any lights on on the side of that door? He couldn't remember. To the best of his recollection, it was very dark. <coughs> he tells you that when they arrive, or when he arrives and other officers arrive, that at some point, Officer Weir and Sergeant Greerberg um, go to enter into the, house, into the home, and they're confronted by the children. And at some point, um, Officer Weir puts the children in, a, in Officer Weir's cruiser. He goes inside the door with, um, I believe it was Sergeant Gersick, he testified, and they go in to secure the residence. They go into the living room, they come into the kitchen area, and they see Michael Black on the ground. And at that time, Michael Black 
is alive. They walk over Michael Black to go into the three bedrooms in the bathroom to make sure that nobody else is in the home. He tells you that when he goes in and he encounters Michael Black, there's blood everywhere. There's blood all over the walls, there's blood down the hallway, there's blood on the carpeting, there's blood on the doors, there's blood in the bedroom, and I believe he said it was the master bedroom. There's blood everywhere, indicative of the fact that Michael Black was walking or traveling throughout his home after he was shot. He tells us that when he first sees Michael Black, he's having a gonal respiration, and that when he tries to render aid to him, he can't find a pulse. But he does later testify to the fact that an EMT does find a faint pulse, and as a result of that, Michael Black receives CPR and is transported to the hospital. I want to bring you back to the fact that Officer Murray testified the blood, again, was everywhere, indicative of the fact that Michael Black was walking around in his home, either before he called 911 or while he was on the phone with 911. And I say that because when you see the pictures of Michael Black that are taken by Officer Murray, there's no phone next to him. And we know from the testimony of other officers that the phone that is found near the bedroom on the floor underneath the, to the toy sword is actually the phone that he called 911 with. And that the other phone that's found in the kitchen on the counter is his work phone. <coughs> Going back to what Officer Murray observed when he first got there. It's November, it's 7.43 p.m., and again, it's dark. When I asked him about the fragment that he found after the house had been secured, after Michael Black had been removed, and he went outside to see um, evidence, or if he could find any evidence, he tells you that he, viewed, that he found a fragment. But in order to find that fragment, he had to use a flashlight tells you that spotlights were actually placed in the vicinity of the house so that he could take pictures. Because if you remember, I asked him, why, is, why does this house appear so bright? And he told you, we had spotlights set up. So if you take those spotlights out, that area where the shooting took place was very, very dark. And I don't know if you recall, but my memory serves me that he said there was nothing visible to the naked eye. Remember that, as I call it. <coughs> the next person that we heard testimony from, which I believe is clearly important, is Kayla O'Brien. Kayla O'Brien, the young neighbor of Michael Black. She lives right next door. She tells you that um, she arrives home from Walmart. At some point, her mom tells her you left your lights on. She goes outside to turn off the lights. She's not exactly sure of the time. She believes it's somewhere between 7.30 and 7.45. She tells you that when she goes outside to turn off the light, she sees a gold van, a gold minivan pass her. She can't even tell you anything about the minivan other than it's gold and it looked old and it was making a lot of noise. She tells you that she sees two men get out of the van. She sees one man open the hood, and the other man started walking. It's a little bit confusing what direction she tells you that the, the, the second man starts walking. But if you remember on cross, I got her to point out or say that the second man walks towards her house and towards her, and then turns around and walks away from her, walking in an easterly direction on Elk. She also tells you that at no time does she see who they are. She can't give you a description of who they are. She has no idea what race they are because she doesn't make eye contact with them, and that's important. She can't identify any of the two men that she sees in the area. 
She wasn't sure exactly where she was standing when she first seen him. She wasn't sure exactly where she was when she first observed the gold minivan. But she knows that the gold minivan passes her at least twice. But she can't give you a description of the gold minivan other than it's a, a minivan. She doesn't give you any indication, and you've seen, you've seen from the pictures, that the gold minivan had damage to it. And we heard Lieutenant Finan state that there was a tail light that was out on the passenger side. And clearly, the minivan passes her in two directions, one direction that she can see that passenger tail light. Remember, Kayla cannot identify anybody. What do we know about Michael Black's shooting? We know that Dr. Shaw, the medical examiner, came in and testified. She did an autopsy, and she testified. And basically, when I crossed her, she told us in layman's terms, that Michael Black died as a result of drowning in his own blood as a result of a gunshot. She told us that the manner of death was homicide. She tells us that the entry wound into his chest was not a close range shot. She tells us basically, Michael was shot at a distance. That's important for you to remember. He was not shot at close range, in the dark, in an area that had no light. Now I'm going to talk about one of the relationships that Michael Black had. We're going to talk about Courtney Schiaretto. Courtney Schiaretto, who's married to Dennis Munoz, gets married in 2013 to Dennis Munoz, still remains married to Dennis Munoz. Courtney, who went to 2015, is on pills, oxys, selling pills. She's on meth, selling meth. And she tells you, if I remember correctly, during direct, that it's party time at the Whitworth's house. That's what she's doing. She's party <coughs> She tells you that she begins seeing Michael Black in the summer of 2015. She tells you that she met Michael Black through Heather and Keith that Michael Black was over Heather and Keith's house, and that she saw him on a regular basis. I believe she even testified on direct about a time that Dennis and Michael Black are at Heather and Keith's house at the same time. And her testimony was, if I remember correctly, that the conversation that took place was a basic conversation, where Dennis said to Michael, you curse a lot. And Mike's response was some cursing about the fact of his cursing. That's the conversation that took place when Mike and Dennis were together. Let's get into her relationship with Mike Black. She says that they start talking to each other. She feels comfortable with him. Um, he's easy to talk to. And another part of their relationship is drugs. She sells him drugs. She does drugs. He'd stop by in the morning before he went to work, and she would sell him drugs. She also tells you that they kept that relationship between them because they were both married. They didn't want anybody to know about the fact that they were having an affair. But she also tells us that Heather knew about the affair. She tells us eventually that Mike Robinson knew about the affair. And we know that because I talked to her about text messages relating to some relationship that she had with Mike and, and the fact that she was talking to him about having sex with Mike. And I mean Mike Black. Let's talk about Courtney Schiaretto and her role here. Courtney tells you that she gives Dennis Mike Black's phone number. Now, she doesn't want to start problems because she wants to keep the peace, but she gives Mike Black's phone number to Dennis. 
She also testifies that at some point she's on Dennis's phone and she's using her Facebook. Here's a woman who wants to keep an affair secret, but she's going to go on her Facebook and text Mike Black on her husband's phone to call her. Innocent? Not on purpose? I would say not. She wants you to believe <coughs> that she's the victim. Dennis is the bad guy. But she clearly pits Dennis against Mike, Mike Robinson against Dennis, Mike Black against Dennis. She's not an innocent here. She knows exactly what she's doing. We know from the text messages between Mike Black and Dennis, and you'll have those in evidence and you'll be able to review those. During those text messages in July, Courtney stirs up things between Dennis and Mike Black. Courtney tells Mike Black, why are you telling stuff about me to your wife? Be a man, if you have a problem with me, contact me. Dennis hadn't said anything to him. Dennis had Mike Black's phone number at the time. Courtney is the person who keeps stirring things up. We know this not only by her actions, but we also know it because Dolores Palmer tells you. Courtney kept stirring things up between Mike Black and Dennis. This is what she does. 